Welcome to Lesson 13D, Turbulent Flat Plate Boundary Layer. In this lesson, we describe transition from laminar to turbulent boundary layer on a flat plate. We'll discuss some differences between the two profiles. I'll show some empirical equations for the flat plate turbulent boundary layer, and we'll compare some properties to those of laminar flow. I'll discuss the effect of surface roughness, and I'll do an example problem, actually two example problems. First, I'll briefly discuss transition to turbulence on a flat plate boundary layer. There's a uniform stream from left to right, and the plate is parallel to that flow. X starts at the leading edge of the plate. I sketch the Blasius profile here in the laminar portion of the flow. But around 1 times 10 to the fifth Reynolds number, we start to get some waviness and unsteadiness in the laminar boundary layer. This is a ballpark number, and it depends greatly on roughness, the quality of the free stream flow, vibrations, etc. The first thing that happens is we get some 2D waves. These are called tolmine schlichting waves. Then we get some 3D effects. And during all this time, the boundary layer is growing more rapidly. Later, we get some hairpin eddies, which are vortices in a kind of a U or a V shape that lift off of the wall. Later, we get turbulent spots, which are isolated pockets of fully turbulent flow surrounded by flow that is not yet turbulent. Then finally, far enough downstream, we have fully developed turbulent flow. These numbers are ballpark numbers, but we almost always have fully developed turbulent flow beyond about a Reynolds number of 3 million. For engineering purposes, we define a critical Reynolds number, below which the boundary layer is most likely laminar, and above which it's most likely turbulent. This critical Reynolds number is around 5 times 10 to the fifth. That's what we'll use in this course to determine whether the boundary layer is laminar or turbulent. I note here that the vertical scale is greatly exaggerated for clarity. I plotted the actual boundary layer to scale, where the x and y axes are the same. On this scale, you can't even see the laminar boundary layer, which is in this tiny portion. Transition actually extends for a long time, and then the flow is fully turbulent. I adjusted these numbers so that 30 on this x scale is the same as a Reynolds number of 3 million. Our approximation that the boundary layer is very thin compared to plate length is reasonable even for the turbulent flow. Let's examine the boundary layer profiles. For the laminar case, this curve is the Blasius boundary layer profile, and the slope at the wall times mu is tau w. Here's a sketch of the turbulent boundary layer, which is much fuller than the laminar case. The slope del u del y at the wall is much larger. In other words, u is increasing more rapidly with y for the turbulent case. This larger tau w leads to larger skin friction for the turbulent case. We've seen this fuller profile before. In a previous lesson, we talked about pipe flow, where we compared the laminar profile to the turbulent profile for the same flow rate, and we had remarked that this is fuller. Keep in mind that for pipe flow and for boundary layer flow, these turbulent profiles are time averaged, since the actual flow is quite unsteady. Now let's calculate some quantities of interest for the turbulent flat plate boundary layer. Note that these are empirical equations, since the actual turbulent flow is very complex and cannot be solved analytically. We need supercomputers even to simulate these kind of flows at high Reynolds numbers. But using these empirical equations, or curve fits, we can estimate quantities of interest and compare them to the laminar flat plate case. There are many empirical curve fits for turbulent boundary layer. Here are two of the most popular ones, the 1 7th law in column A and the 1 5th law in column B. Either one is acceptable, but they give slightly different values. For purposes of this course, we'll always use these column B equations. In the textbook, I give these coefficients to only two digits, since these equations are not very accurate. But for engineering problems, we still typically report our results to three digits. But keep in mind that these are based on empirical curve fits that have a lot of scatter. I note here that CFx is a local skin friction coefficient at some x value. If we're interested in the entire skin friction force on the plate, we have to integrate CFx from x equals 0 to x equals L, the end of the plate. We did the same thing for laminar flow and got this result. And this is the equation we get for the turbulent boundary layer using the one-fifth law of column B. We see that we use our critical Reynolds number to decide whether the flow is laminar or turbulent, as I stated earlier. There's actually an upper limit 
of 10 to the 7th, where this equation is no longer reliable. You can improve on this equation by combining the laminar and the turbulent part. This equation is one such attempt for Reynolds numbers in this range, especially if it's on the lower end. We combine these two equations for laminar and turbulent flow and merge them into this equation. When the Reynolds number is large, the laminar portion is insignificant. I should mention that this equation, in fact all of the equations in this table for turbulent boundary layer, assume that the boundary layer is turbulent right from the beginning of the plate at x equals zero, whereas this equation takes into account the laminar portion. It still neglects the transition region, which as we saw earlier is a large part of this type of flow. Another comment is that all of these equations are for smooth plates without any roughness. Now I consider what happens when we add wall roughness. As we saw with pipe flows in a previous lesson, when the plate is rough, average skin friction coefficient CF increases with roughness epsilon. Here's a plot from our textbook. This is similar to the Moody chart, but it's for flat plate boundary layers. And the turbulent flow curves look somewhat similar, where we have the totally smooth curve. And as we increase roughness, these curves veer off and give a higher CF. One big difference here is that though this is increasing wall roughness as it was with the Moody chart, here we plot curves of constant L over epsilon, whereas in the Moody chart we used epsilon over D. Since this is kind of upside down compared to this, these values are decreasing instead of increasing. Notice also the fully rough region beyond which these curves flatten out. We saw a similar thing with pipe flow and the Moody chart. There are some empirical equations for these flows, but if you're in the fully rough region, the correlations become much simpler. This is the equation that we'll use for the fully rough turbulent regime. But if the Reynolds number is not large enough to be in this fully rough regime, you can use this chart to pick off some values of CF. Of course, that won't be very accurate. Now let's do some example problems. As promised in a previous lesson, I now repeat this exact same problem where Craig drives with a piece of plywood on his roof rack at a given speed and air properties. We want to calculate boundary layer thickness at the end of the plate and the drag force on the plate. In a previous lesson, we assumed that the boundary layer was laminar, but the Reynolds number was above 10 to the sixth. And as I pointed out in the previous lesson, at such a high Reynolds number, this boundary layer is turbulent. These were our laminar flow results for comparison. Now let's solve for the turbulent boundary layer case. We assume epsilon equals zero. In other words, the plate is smooth. We'll use column B, the one-fifth law equations. First, we'll calculate delta boundary layer thickness. The one-fifth law empirical equation is repeated here. And at x equal L, delta equal L times 0 0.38 over REL to the one-fifth. I plug in L, Reynolds number, and a unity conversion factor. So the turbulent boundary layer thickness is 48.6 millimeters. Compared to our laminar case, this is about 6.4 times larger. I'll also compare displacement thickness. For the laminar case, we had 2.64 millimeters. For the turbulent case, we get 6.14 millimeters, which again is higher. Note that these are at the same Reynolds number. Next, we'll calculate FD, the skin friction drag. This was our expression for FD for the previous lesson. That same equation holds now, except we use a different CF, namely the equation for the one-fifth law and a smooth plate. We note that this is the drag on both sides of the plate, top and bottom. When we plug in the numbers, we get 3.4 newtons for the turbulent case, which is about 4.6 times larger than FD laminar which was 0 0.735 newtons. We conclude that a turbulent boundary layer has much more friction drag than a laminar boundary layer under the same conditions and at the same Reynolds number. In this particular problem, the turbulent case is the correct one since our Reynolds number is much larger than the critical Reynolds number. I'll do a second example, also the same example that we did in the laminar case in a previous lesson where Professor Wakeflow was studying far wakes in a wind tunnel but this time she runs the tunnel at a much higher speed. In the previous lesson, we talked about the displacement thickness effects and how it makes the airspeed increase downstream. And so she expands the cross-sectional area of the test section. I use the same air properties as previously, and the dimensions of the test section are the same as before. 
but were run at a higher speed, little more than a factor of 10, 65.5 meters per second instead of 6.5 meters per second in the laminar case. But all else is the same as in the previous lesson, which was for a laminar boundary layer. Here we'll have a turbulent boundary layer. I calculate the Reynolds number at the end of the test section, which is about 2.2 million, so this is turbulent. We'll use our one-fifth law to calculate delta star, and I get 1.3188 millimeters. We can use the same equation for the adjusted height, HL, as we had in the previous lesson, which I rewrite here. The only thing different is the delta star. When I plug in the numbers, I get 0.41635 meters. So the difference in test section height from the beginning to the end of the test section turns out to be 4.35 millimeters. As you recall, this difference is the difference in height after we tilt the bottom wall to account for the displacement thickness effects. I'll end by comparing to the laminar case. We had HL minus H naught equals 6.19 millimeters for that case, which is larger than our present value of 4.35 millimeters. The alert viewer may be questioning why, because I said that turbulent boundary layers are much thicker than laminar ones. But that's true when the Reynolds numbers are the same. Here our Reynolds number is roughly 10 times larger, and quantities like delta, delta star, cf, etc. go down as Reynolds number increases. In other words, the faster the flow, the thinner the boundary layer. In this example problem, that's true even though the present boundary layer is turbulent while the previous one was laminar. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.